For What Remains is a sci-fi game, a sci-fi war game more specifically, for two players primarily, but you can also play it solo in one of two ways. The one recommended in the rule book using an AI that comes with the game, or my way, in which I just play both sides to the best of my possibilities, and I still like it, and that's, and that's the way I played it, so my assessment of the game is based on that mode. For What Remains is a modular game, that means you have several sets, each is a standalone set, with the same title, but a different subtitle, and each comes with all you need to play the game, but specific with two factions, and you can mix and match the faction of any set and pit them against any faction from any other set. And in this video, I'm going to show you the out of the basement factions. The games come, it's very modular, very sandboxy, comes with a large selection of terrain tiles. They're also double sided, so between the different ones you use, the orientation, and where you place them in the grid, huge variety here. The negative is that these are pretty thin and flimsy, but again, um, probably the game would have cost a lot more if they were sturdier maybe you wouldn't have had this much replay value so this is it game comes with a scenario book with a campaign made of link scenario or you can play a free-for-all uh, scenario the basic slaughter based scenario you create your confrontation then each player builds their armies and then you send them in and they try to kill each other and see who is better at that. The characters in the game, again, it's post-apocalyptic post sci-fi, no one looks pretty here. And these two parties, pretty much I think of them as messed up necromancers, and there's a bit this party here, and messed up druids, that's how I think of them. We got a geomancer, and these are more... Uh, Botany based, but still pretty messed up. So, each type of character comes with tokens representing the character itself, but you don't have any stats on the tokens, you only have the have the illustration, the name that identifies them, and then the level that tells us if that's a recruit or a veteran, like in this case, or if there is an E there, um, that means elite. Then these symbols here link the tokens to activation tokens that we will see later. They are placed in a bag and when drawn will then activate the corresponding character. The tokens representing the characters are also double sided. One side represents the healthy character and the other side when the character takes a hit then it's injured. The the character are stacked, that means that if you have a recruit, well that's just a recruit, but if you have a veteran, then you put a veteran on top of the recruit, and when the veteran takes a hit, now it is injured, and when it takes another hit, then you remove that one, and you have the next one, so you need to re remove the entire stack to eliminate the character. Another thing that we need to talk about or mention at least is that the game comes with a nice pool of 10-sided dice and these are the randomizers that you use in the game. We also have oversight monsters, really cool. Now, players will decide on the number of skirmish points that they will use to build their armies and if you want to balance things you don't have to give them the same number of skirmish points to the players and using these templates here then you will know first how much how much they cost in terms of points and then you will build your your army say for example i want a veteran fallen that's five points I want an elite wraith, then it's six points, and so on and so forth. This template here will also tell you the stats of those creatures, so the movement points that they have, weapon range for range attacks, and I wish that the the range combat value was right under the weapon range because that makes sense but that's not it so you have the weapon range close combat values and range combat values and these are the number of dice that you roll when you're attacking using close combat or range combat respectively 
and then defense value. Then also a range of abilities and that's really the only thing that makes the game a little uh, complex. The game is exceedingly simple when it comes to his basic mechanics, but you need to become familiar with all of these effects. You have very good player rates. My recommendation is just set up the game and start playing, and then you will learn the effects as you go. Some, as you can see, come with quite a bit of text. And so the first time that you play, you'll kind of suck a little bit at it because you won't know the effects, you'll forget some, you will not be able to use them at the right time, but it's a more interesting way for me to learn the game than just trying to memorize all of these effects. Now, the game is a chat pool game, meaning that in order to activate units that are on the board, I'm just gonna put them sort of randomly here, not even making the stacks. In order to activate those units, you will need to draw chits from a bag. And again, you have all of these activation chits and more that I'm showing you here. Interesting, here is the mechanism. For each unit, you have three activation chits. For, so for the death vine, with that symbol, there are three activation chits. For the yellow boar, with that symbol, three activation chits. At the beginning of each turn, each player will secretly select which activation chits actually go in the bag. Which means, uh, and the number is one activation chit per unit. I have four units, I'll put four activation chits in there. However, it doesn't mean that I need to place one for each unit that I have. So, for example, I could put, I could place in there three for these nethermancer here and only one for, for somebody else. Uh, those will go there. And so on and so forth. So part of the part of the idea, part of the fun when you're playing against other humans is that you do not know exactly what the opponent has placed in the bag. For me, how do I do it? How is my way of doing it solitaire, playing both sides the best of my possibilities and preserving the uncertainty about how many tokens will come out here for each? It's very simple. For each unit in there, I place all tokens in there and then I simply draw and activate until say that side has drawn four of these tokens that that side has drawn four activation tokens this side has drawn two and that's the way it is so I still don't know if a unit will activate zero one two or three times in a turn another interesting idea is that the activation tokens that are used in a turn are not placed back in the back. So if a unit activated a lot this turn, then that unit will not activate a lot, or maybe not at all, the following turn. Again, very interesting. So again, as there's a lot of randomness here, but seeing which tokens have been drawn, then it makes it less likely for some units to be activated again. Then also each side has a special token that instead of having a unit on one side and the faction symbol on the other has the faction symbol on both, you get to place that unit in the bag when you kill an enemy unit as a reward and when it is drawn, it's like a while, when you draw it then you can activate any of your units but it doesn't go back in the bag, it's put back in the general supply until you kill somebody and then you get the reward again. So activation, so chit pull activation with the plot twist that you choose which ones go in there exactly and the tokens is using one turn will sit out the next turn which really has an interesting effect on the general flow of the game. The general idea of the game is very simple. When the activation token for a unit is drawn, the unit gets to activate. When you activate a unit, you can pass or you can use one of their abilities. If it is an ability that allows you to perform an action, but of course, the main things that you do is move and attack. For movement, you move up to your full movement allowance. Different kinds of terrain may cost you different things. Terrain is identified by those lines there. As for attack, you perform range attacks or close combat attacks using the corresponding values, depending on which one, well, which one you're using. But the general idea for close combat or range is the same, which is you will roll a number of 10-sided dice equal to the factor, the combat factor that you're using, be it ranged, R, or close combat. Suppose I'm attacking 
with an attack of three. I roll those dice and I injure the enemy if I roll at least a number which is higher than the enemy's defense. Remember that value there, defense. That defense may be modified by their abilities, by the terrain, by a variety of things. But the thing is still, if I roll at least one number higher than the defense, I inflict a hit. It doesn't matter how many times I exceed that defense number, it's still one hit per attack. And again, if I inflict a hit, I simply flip to the injured side a fresh token or remove an injured token. That really is the general idea. You continue like this, activating units for movement, combat, and other abilities until one of the two sides has completed the objectives of the scenario, which may be as simple as to kill everybody else. For what remains out of the basement set, so fun, really, really a fun game. It plays smoothly, plays with a really fast pace. And mind you, I play solitaire, so I was always the active player. But I feel that even if I was playing against somebody else, and even if they got two tokens in a row, a single turn or a single activation, I should say, is so fast. I'm moving by five. Da 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 da. I am attacking you. Here are the dice. I double check. I have all the right modifiers, which are not a ton roll the dice and I immediately know at a glance if you're injured or not. And again, even implementing those special actions, uh, once you know them, doesn't take too long. So the pace of the game is really fast, which allows you to play a large battle still in a manageable span of time and then you can set up the game again. So I like the pace of the game, I like that it really keeps the... you really keeps the, the emphasis in the gameplay on the action, on the moving of these monsters, on the shooting, on the attacking, etc, etc, etc. Again, at the beginning there's a little bit of a curve as you're learning about all of those abilities and precisely because of this then I particularly appreciate how simple, straightforward and linear the core mechanic is. Draw a token, move or attack. Attack, pick up a number of dice, roll them at a glance, boom, done. And then the next activation, then the next activation. But around such a lean core of rules, then you have all of these thematic ideas, then you have people teleporting each other, or changing the landscape, stealing the life force, uh, pounding the ground, causing these tremors that are gonna stun everybody. Uh, huge variety of things. These two parties in particular, they go very well together and I like that although I, I found those labels messed up necromancers and messed up druids, they still feel very different from the archetypes of fantasy or science fiction. They really look like, again, fantasy ideas that have been uh, turned into dark, chaotic, weird versions of themselves in a post-apocalyptic landscape and in the process they really became their own thing. They, again, I can tell you what the sources look like, but the outcome are parties of monsters and creatures with very strong personalities that don't feel really much like any other monster or fantasy or sci-fi creature that I've seen in other games. So the theme is nice, both from the point of view of the theme itself, I hadn't seen monsters like, the, like these in other games, and for the originality, for the identity, for the personality of gameplay. Again, it can be as simple as move or attack, this is the heart of the game, but with those monsters it just feels right, it just feels different. So you have these frantic actions with all of these different actions interacting. It's really a compelling uh, style of gameplay. So simple, yet so rich, yet so thematic. There is going to be a massive random element, but that doesn't have to be unwelcome. If you play war games, then you probably appreciate that, otherwise you'd be playing chess if you just wanted everything to be rational and predictable. But despite the randomness of the draw of the tokens over which you have some control, if you're playing the versions in which you decide which tokens go there, then you don't know exactly the order, but you know what you're going to get. And then there is the randomness of the die rolls. So there is a random element, but no more than you have in most war games. Not enough, I believe, uh, to completely make the game uh, completely chaotic. My solitaire version has a lot more luck and randomness, but when you're playing solitaire, it's also about 
responding to these completely crazy levels of unexpectedness and it works very well also because I'm playing both sides so I'm not gonna flip the table if a side has it particularly hard. I'll take it as a fun puzzle then I switch to the other side and I take it as a as a fun uh, opportunity to beat up the opponent. So uh, it works very well, the randomness doesn't bother me, the randomness works just like like I want it to work in war games. Adding unpredictable elements, making it hard to predict the future, forcing me to constantly respond to different changing situations, which is of course one of the things that keeps me interesting the most. For what remains is a very simple introductory level war game. So that's great if you're a new war gamer. The, this could be an interesting option. It has some of the core elements of war gaming, line of sight and range, and all that. Even uh, chit pull activations. But it also has its own personality. So if you're a new war gamer, this is definitely something approachable. It's not gonna be daunting or threatening. If you're a seasoned war gamer, there are just so many different elements to implement here. Some interesting decisions that I find the game is definitely interesting enough. It has enough meat for you to be interested. So uh, high praise from me. Uh, the production is very good, with the exception again of those tiles that could look better and feel better but again at the same time I feel that what you had in exchange for that is more tiles it thin and flimsy but more tiles which means more gameplay option options with the exception of those tiles the production is very good the rules are well written and most importantly gameplay is solid it's smooth fast-paced compelling and overall really really fun for what remains a strong war game in my opinion.